Hello, it's Thursday, it's three o'clock. We're back in one of our woodworking wisdom workshops. Um, we're in the machinery workshop today, machinery, routing, power tools, that kind of workshop. Uh, not in the wood turning, not in the craft, not even in our brand new hand tool, specifically made hand tool workshop, which uh, you'll see Thursday next week. Um, yep, in the machinery workshop. So what have we got on today? We are routing. No surprises there, really. We're, we're, it's a continuation, really, of the project that I've been working on with Ben. Now, Ben is a good way through uh, putting the, the detail into this, this fish, this common carp that we're uh, putting together for a gone fishing sign. Um, I think probably Colwyn's going to end up with it. Um, but today I'm going to do some freehand routing, um, a nameplate sort of sign. Um, I'm going to transfer some letters that I've printed out onto a bit of wood. There you go, gone fishing. Got a couple of different sizes, couple, uh, same kind of font, but one bold and one, one faint. Uh, uh, I'm going to transfer that on the timber and then just literally carve it in, route it in. Now this is great for, for house signs, name plates on kids' doors, uh, your dog's kennel, your dog's name, whatever it is, just really good top tips really on, um, on doing this. And it's a great Thing. If you're new to routing or you've just got a route, you maybe you got one for Christmas, it's a good thing just to have a play and get a feel for the machine. There's obviously do's and don'ts, the kind of better cutters to use than others. So we'll go through those in a moment when we, when we come over to the bench. Um, and we'll also today we'll be looking at some like an introduction to edge molding. So kind of framing your project and putting some detail on that outer edge. So what we'll do we'll get straight over to the bench. So here we go. We have this piece of tulip wood, a bit of poplar, nice and easy to work with. And it is actually the off cut from the end of the fish. You know, this was a continuation of the board. So it's going to look nice. It's going to kind of match our project. I've got this piece of poplar. Now I don't want, I'm not going to make this sign this size. It's going to be considerably smaller, maybe kind of about that big. But I'm going to start on a board this size purely so it gives me a little bit more balance with the router. You know, on a small piece of material, it's easy for your router to, to dip off the edge of your material. So this gives me complete support, knowing that, you know, I've got quite an intricate bit of, bit of lettering to do. I'll go through the cutter and the router I'm going to use in a moment, but I want to talk about gripping and clamping this piece of material to the bench. Now, I could, let me just remove these for a moment. I'll show you these in a minute. I could put that there. I could bring in some of the, uh, the, the hold down clamps that run in the track. This is something that I do frequently. You can see my benches. They've all got these um, UJK tracks just so I can grip and clamp anything anywhere. I could do that. You know, that's really secure. But I do have the risk, potentially, of not being, you know, the, the edge of my router hitting this, not being able to get where I want to be. Potentially, I guess, the cable could get caught on these knobs. So I'm going to try, and I've become quite a fan of these for this sort of work, of these little anti-slip kind of sticky pads that drop into your, um, your dog holes on your bench. Standard 20 mil dog holes. All right, there we go. We get a bit of camera in camera there, Ben. Thank you very much, lovely, well done. All right, so we've got these, let's grab another couple. And when my material is on that, we don't, the, the lightest of downward pressure, it doesn't move. I've got to make sure there's enough underneath so it doesn't rock like that. So I'm just going to add in another one. There we go. Maybe there is better. There we go. Now that is really nice and stable. And I've got confidence that when I'm routing, that isn't going to move. And I guess, indeed, if I wanted to do an edge mould, I could do an edge mould. But I'm going to freehand route some letters, some gone fishing letters in there. I've got a bit of carbon paper that I pinched from Ben. 
All right, he uses this in his pyrography work. So I'm just going to place this kind of in the middle for the moment, really. You can tape this down, and you can tape your, your letters on your piece of paper. Now, this has just simply been, been printed out choosing a particular font. I can't remember the name of the font. Not that it's that important right now. I'm just trying to level it up. You can put lines on your material if you want, just to help you get it straight and parallel. But that's kind of where I want it. I fold it over that edge, and that actually helps keep it in position. All I do now is literally go on fishing. I've made sure that I've got shiny side down on my paper. One's a kind of matte side. And the other side, you'll see noticeably, you can just catch it in the light there, is noticeably shiny. All right. And as I said, you could put a bit of tape on these corners if you felt the need. But just a simple follow with a, with a pencil. And I've got a sharp pencil and quite a fat line here, quite a thick line. So I'm going to go in the middle of my, my line. Here we go. And this doesn't take long to transfer onto the timber. And this is just really so I keep each letter the same size in proportion with the next and kind of in line and level. Here we go, and the G. Whoop. All right, let's see what we've got. Easily something clear enough to follow with my router cutter. I've got the router cutter loaded in. I've got it in the, the Bosch GKF 600 router. Let me get it all right in the camera for you. There you go, GKF 600, um, which really is, is a motor, uh, motor unit, and you can choose the base that you want. I've got it in the plunging base, which I always find best for, for routing. It's easier to plunge in and then release it to come on to the next letter. You can get also a fixed base for this router, all right, which is great for edge work. This particular machine has become a favorite of mine for this kind of work because it's, it's light and handy and just feels good in the hand without being too big, too bulky, maybe even too powerful. The cutter that I've got loaded in is a V-groove cutter, quite a pointy one, 60 degree V-groove. All right. Now, if you buy a new router and you buy a box set of cutters to go with, well, you're probably going to have a V-groove cutter in there of some description. Let me just make sure you can see that. There we go. Let me see that. But these will more commonly be 45 degrees. They're great for doing this sort of work, but if you need to plunge down into your material, they can leave quite a, quite a wide channel. So, as said, I select, and my favourite for doing lettering, the 60 degree V. All right. Quite forgiving, quite easy to handle. You don't find the router pulls one way or another and gives you complete control, which is important with something like this. You could, there are other options for cutters. We've got the, the round nose cutter. These come in various sizes. This one's about eight millimetres in diameter here. These are by 8mm, there's no degree angle on this, but these are 8mm in diameter across here. This one you could plunge in as deep as you wanted to. I tend not to use these a little bit for this job. You could, but I just find they, they give me, in particular this size, the channel would be just a little bit too wide. And I prefer the cleaner kind of V-cut that you get on a, um, on, on a V-groove cutter. You could indeed use a good old straight cutter. Now, most routers, uh, router cutter sets, they do come with a couple of different sizes, and this is great, but of course, this is going to give you a flat bottom hole, isn't it? Which might be the look you're going for. Absolutely fine. These are even more difficult to handle, because what happens with the rotation of the cutter, as you, as you plunge in, the rotation of the cutter, you pull towards you, the cutter will naturally drift to the left. You push away from you, the cutter will naturally drift the other way. It's just called cutter drift. And it's difficult to try and fight against that without any guide when you're trying to do freehand. If it is a flat bottom hole that you want to try and produce, recommended are the spiral cutters, solid carbide spiral cutters. Um, they, 
the sharp edge lasts a long time. I find the quality of carbide in these spirals is superb. There are a good number on our website. Variety of different sizes from three, four, five, six, seven, eight mil, I think, in diameter here. Uh, oh, I, I think we've got a question. Yes. So, Craig, you've shown us a, a f quite a few different shaped cutters there. Yeah. Um, sharpening them, is there an easy way we can sharpen them for the home use, or yeah. is it a specialist thing? No, no. I mean, obviously, you can get cutters specially sharpened, and it's kind of what I used to do for a living back in, uh, in a previous life. Um, I think the easy way to keep your, sh your cutters uh, in tip-top fashion is just obtain one of these little diamond laps. Right, no. It's a piece of steel that's diamond dusted. There's different grades. We have 120, 180, 240, 320 grit. Now, basically, the particles that are dusted on this steel, they're a little bit bigger as, as the, 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 the number gets lower. So the 120 grit, the particle will be bigger and will cut faster and coarser. The 320 will be quite fine particles, quite quite uh, a light dusting. And it's the, only the 320 that I use on sharpening router cutters. The method I use is, let's take the V-groove for a moment. Now, try and stay away from this outer edge. Try and only work on this inner flat surface here. Every cutter we've got has that, that outer edge, which is very difficult to follow but it's got a nice, wide, flat surface on the inside here, which is really easy to follow with a, with a, with a diamond lap. I just do them freehand, all right? So I will be holding it something like that. I'll be trying to find my flat surface. I'll try, you can literally just feel it, and it's good to start there and then bring it down to the tip. If you tip too much that way, where well, you're gonna, uh, um, the opposite effect, really, in blunting the cutter. And if you tip too much that way, well, you're nowhere near the cutting edge, so you're not really doing anything. So just in there, find the flat spot. And a little tip, actually, what you could do, you could get a black marker pen and black this out. Just black that out like that. And then just lightly, with the, like I said, the, the 320 grade, just give it some strokes there and then you can see the black being removed and you can know that you're on the right angle. So what I'll tend to do is give it some equal strokes. So one, two, three, four, five. Other side, find the flat spot. One, two, three, four, five. I think it's important that you try and keep both flutes, you know, or both cutters, these are known as flutes or wings sometimes, keep them equal try and remove the same amount of material because of course when we're sharpening we are removing material there's a little bit of carbide come off there still you can see that so these sort of things very uh, low cost um, and will keep a lot of different tools sharpened actually um, I think the spirals are probably the difficult thing to sharpen and that is a bit of a specialist job um, Having said that, they do tend to last for ages and ages and ages, and it may be more cost-effective for you to, to dispose of them than to get them resharpened. But there's nothing that you can't sharpen. So, that's a bit on cutters. Was that okay? Was that useful? Great. So we've got our gone fishing, right? We're happy with, you know, my material is stable on the bench. I've got my cutter loaded. I've got me. 60 degree cutter in there we can see that now how deep into the material do i need to go there's a specific way i like to do this all right so we can just change that camera and ca oh no no we're good we'll leave that there all right so what i'll do i'll release the plunge stop pull it up out of the way all routers have this all right i'll plunge down till my cutter just lightly touches my material. Now it's, make, it's important with this particular shape of cutter that you do it lightly. You don't push down hard and stab the cutter into your material, giving you a false depth. Because what we're looking to do is what's called zeroing off. Boom, there, touched. Now the cutter is exactly the same level. It's not protruding through the base at all. It's the same level as the base. If I just rock that that way, you can see that there. 
what I need is just a little bit of cutter projection through the base. And I've got a nice quick fix for this for you. Now, my eyesight isn't what it used to be. I do struggle to see these, these scales. You've got numbers here, you've got a little red indication line, and nice of Bosch, they've got metric and imperial here for you. So if you're the generation I am that are gonna kind of think and work in both, that's great. However, I do struggle to see these. And they need, I, I like to work at controlled depths. This particular project, I'm only wanting to go two millimeters into my material. I'm struggling to see two mil here, I've got to tell you. So I'll double check my plunge, down. What we can do, because we've got this released and free, how about using one of these bog standard drill bits just to, to set your depth? Now, most people in the workshop are going to set their drill bits. Quite often, it's quite a comprehensive set going from one millimeter to 19 millimeters in 0.5 increments. So you can set depth however and whatever you want using this. I'll turn it around as you've just seen. So I use the, the shank of the drill bit. And I will sandwich the drill bit in between the top of the stop and the bottom of the sliding stop there. You see that? So it's just, I'll do that again. All right, so that's slid up out of the way. Do do, bonk, and I've pinched it. I will then lock this position off like that. And then I'll remove that. What have I got there? I've got a two millimeter gap. So now when I plunge down, I'll get two millimeter projection of cutter through the base, fixed and positive. I and mean, if you make sure this is locked off each time, every time you up and down with your plunge, which you need to do on some lettering, you come down to a positive stop every time. Okay, we're almost set to go. What I tend to do, because I've got a lot of plunging in this uh, particular job, um, now routers don't take a lot of maintenance. If you, oops, I'll over there. If you, um, if you've got reasonably good extraction, which is important to keep your lungs clean and your um, and your workspace clear, and kind of helps you see um, these particular fine lines I've drawn here, helps you see those. Um, we need just to, to a little bit of maintenance. So what I want to do is if we can go back to the Aster baby, thank you very much, is just a little bit of squirt on those columns. It's just a dry lubricant. Right, we don't like to use anything too, uh, too wet and messy in a woodworking workshop. We tend not to use oils too much. And then what I've got is a mud oil. Oh, straight away, a much smoother plunge. All right, you just need, and it's important that you try and keep these slides clean, you know, and that helps prevent rust buildup because these can rust and it just keeps everything smooth and flowing. Okay, so my depth is set, my material's secure. I'll get my PPE on, um, eyes and ears I'm gonna use for this one. I'm gonna hook it up to, my extractor as well. It's an auto switching Bosch extractor, a very posh one. All right, I'll plug my machine in and I'm plugging the router into the, uh, the extractor itself. So I want to trigger my router. There we go. When we trigger the router, the, uh, the extractor comes on. And when I release the trigger on the router, the router will turn off. All right, you can see that. So I'm uh, all hooked up, ready to go. Okay, get my eyes and ears on. Right, so we're going to start on the G. Closing down, finding that point, and there we go. Let's just do the G first. See what we get. Following that line, feels really good in the hand this way, so. And there we go, release the plunge, oh. yeah. I always release the plunge, I'm coming up to position that there. All right. And there we've got nice clean G started. But one thing I found a little bit awkward was having to, to bend over to try and see it. Now sometimes I can be at the bench for, for quite some time uh, and this is um, where it becomes a little bit awkward. So why not introduce a stool? 
Now, instantly, it puts you at a much better viewing angle for your, um, for your work. And if you've got a long job to do, you're not kind of bent over, giving you a bad back. We protect our ears, protect our eyes, <laughs> protect our lungs with good extraction, but you'll end up with a bad back. So we're just going to sit down and make ourselves comfortable. Okay. All right, and let's just crack on with the rest. So, quite often the, the round, the zero, or the north, the O is one of the most difficult ones to, to do. Nice and clean. And clean. benefit of being able to just release that plunge to come up out of one letter and into the next. Stop the eyes. The great visibility through here. You see everything that's going on. The writer's not fighting against me. And I think it's good with, with any power tool to, to feel comfortable in the hand. So you're not fighting against it. You're not struggling with that tool. It almost becomes an extension of your hand. With any power to be a drill, a sander, or something a little bit more complex, yes, but certainly versatile, the router. Just imagine some of the projects that you've made. Maybe a good tool box, maybe some garden planters, maybe carve, carve in some, some ivy on the side of one of those planters, just in the very same way. And it doesn't really take long. Okay, plunge released, it's safe to put that down on the bench. Okay. So there, let's come over to you. Gone fishing. That's really nice and clean. It's level. It's at an equal depth, and I particularly chose this font so it looks like a, like a handwritten kind of gone fishing sign. All right. It is a bit too big though, isn't it? I know this isn't going to look um, proportionally right, maybe, hanging underneath, hanging underneath Ben's fish. It's a bit big. So really I need to, to take it down a size. And that's where I'm going to go up, go and use my table saw quickly. So, if you can uh, follow me over to the table saw, thank you very much. All right. I've got a big bit of timber here and my blade is wound up to the max, so I'm just going to drop the blade a little bit. There we go, till I've got about, oh, I don't know, three quarters of an inch, 20 millimeters above my workpiece. I'll bring my fence over. Now, I could, I guess, get measuring and marking, getting everything where I need it. But I'm just going to eye this. I've got a really good sight line down here. And I'm just going to try and make... So when I've cut through here, that this gap is kind of equal to that gap, roughly. Like I said, I could have marked it, could have measured it, but I'm not that fast. Let's lock off this fence nice and positively. Let's flick the extraction on. All right. Just pull that down, make sure we don't make contact. All right. Push stick at the ready. And we're through. Nice steady start. Now it's all over to the push stick. Through we go. Continue on through. Turn it off. I just wait for that to come to a stop. Collect me a bit of wood. Let's have a look. Right. So where are we at? So there. You can see where we're at. We've gone fishing. Um, it still looks a little bit too long to me, so we need to kind of chop these ends off, which I'm going to do next. So let me bring the fence out of the way, nudge that back. Don't need a push stick on a sliding carriage. 
So I'm just going to offer that up. I think I like the look of that. Let's turn them on and slide on through. I'm going to leave that off cut there. It's not going to get in anybody's way. I'm certainly not going to go fishing for it. I could, if I really felt the need, flick it out of the way with my push stick, but I don't feel the need. And I'll do the other side. Right, where are we? Here we go. Let's have a look. Eye it up. And slide on through. And there we go. All right. There we have it. Cut the size. Let's get rid of these offcuts out of the way. Right, we'll come back over and see what we've got. We can see that that, that now kind of looks a bit more, well, what I'm looking for, looks a bit better. We are getting to where, oops, where am I? Yeah, getting the right spot, Craig. There we go. Gone fishing. And we're going to hang that underneath that. That's going to look cool. I don't know if I know if I'm not going to give this a call. And actually, I might keep it myself. Next job. What is next job? We've got to, I mean, this looks good as is, but you've got these square edges. And I, I like to kind of frame my project, put in some detail on this outer edge. Um, so I'm going to do this on the router table. It is quite a small piece, so I'm going to have some assistance with a couple of little jigs that we've made. Um, but I've got to do a cutter change on my router table first, because if we can get to this shot here, what I've got in there is a rebate cutter. A square rebate. It's great for knocking out rebates and corners and stuff, but it's not the look that I want. I'm gonna go with something. Oh, I've got so many edge molding cutters to choose from. I am spoiled. We've got such a vast range. I oh, know they're edge molding cutters. Look, it says so. So I could choose any one of these. Well, maybe not all of these. Some of them are just simply too big. To do the job you can see this this thumb mold cutter would be would be massive on this piece of material um, even this kind of big round over cutter still massive on this size of material um, so you know you've got roman ogs you've got round over cutters now, often again if you buy a box set of ra router cutters you'll get a couple of cutters not too dissimilar to these two All right these are round over cutters Great, just to ease corners and round over the edge. Variety of different sizes. You can even change the bearings on these to, to give you a little step in this corner. Um, it's a really handy cutter. Um, this size is great because it works really well on, on timber of this kind of shape and size. Maybe that one's just a smidge too big, but that's fine. There you go. That's what we're looking at doing. The bearing's going to follow, follow the... Uh, the run around the, the timber itself. I've got a particular favourite I like to use for this sort of stuff. It's a little bit more snazzy. It's not that one. It's that one. It's a bit more snazzy. All right, you can see that. It's called a double bead roundover. You can probably see why. It kind of looks like the roundover cutter I showed you, but it's kind of got a couple of double beads. It just adds in that little bit more detail um, looks a bit more flash and a little, maybe a little bit more delicate. So that's the cutter I'm going to put in my machine now. So I'm going to leave that there for a moment. All right. And it, we'll get back to uh, that camera one view, if you would be so kind. There we go. Tuck those away. So I'm going to do a cutter change. I'm going to open all this up out of the way. I'm just to expand the fences, just to make access a little bit easier. I'm going to put my workpiece down where I remember to put it. Um, I'm going to unplug my machine. Now, I like, we've got the Bosch 1600 underneath our router table here, which you can, it comes with two bases. You've got the plunge base, which we've got fixed and we leave underneath our table. It, it's great for that sort of stuff. Uh, the plunging base we can use on the bench if we've got any big, big tasks to do. We've got these big cutters to use. Um, but I tend to keep it underneath my router table because it really does make cutter change a lot easier. That dro simply drops in there and locks. Okay. I'm going to do a cutter change now. So it's got a nice handy spindle lock. There we go. 24 mil cutter. Oh, sorry. 24 mil spanner. And that. We're undone. You're not going to go crazy tight on these 
these router coins. Just there we go. You see, I had to undo that twice. It's got a secondary safety lock. So if you've got one of these routers and you you undo it, you think, all right, that's undone. Then you go in with your hands, you come to undo it a bit more, and you think, oh, that's that's gone stiff again. Maybe it's cross-threaded. It's not cross-threaded. It, it, like I say, it's a secondary safety lock, which, uh, which helps you out. Stops the potential, although it is very, very rare, the potential for cutters to, uh, to come out. I'm going to change the collets. So I've gone from quite a chunky cutter. Thank you. Quite a chunky half-inch shank cutter. To, I'm going to be using a much smaller, finer quarter-inch shank cutter. So I'm literally changing from the half-inch collet to the quarter-inch collet, which on the larger routers is a simple thing to do. Most come with both. Um, the smaller routers, like the Bosch I was using at the bench, the little GKF 600, it's only quarter-inch shank. So slightly smaller cutters. Some of the very big ones, they just don't work in that machine. Um, but having said that, that particular GKF 600 is so useful in the hand. It's a great size. I will. Yeah, it's important that to prevent getting your collet and cutter stuck inside the machine, you make sure that these, the collet and the nut, are snapped together as one. They all clip together. If you insert the collet into the, into the machine, let's get a better view. If you insert the collet into there first, then put the nut on, there's a real risk you're going to get the collet and then the cutter stuck inside the machine. They've got to be clipped in as, as one, as I said, because the collet is designed to, uh, the, the nut is designed to withdraw the collet and cutter. And if they're not clipped together as one, as I said, you probably will get it stuck. And it can be a real pain in the bum to get them out. Um, sometimes you literally got to destroy the cutter, collet, and nut just um, doing that. So, Spin the lock down, lock that in. Now, how far do I push this in and out? Um, please don't be tempted to, oh, I can't quite get the, the projection of cut I need. I can't quite get that cut. Don't pull it out too far like this, because that will happen, guaranteed. I've seen it, it's horrible, especially when these are spinning at kind of anywhere from 16 to 30,000 RPM, um, and they're sharp cutters whizzing around, so make sure that Every cutter's actually got a little indication line on there. It's known, quite often known as a K-line. Um, so work on that line. Older cutters may not have it, and it does actually wear off the cutters. And I like to put them in three quarters of the way along the shank. If you've not got that indication mark, three, where are, where's the old? There we go. Three quarters of the way along the shank. All right. Spin the lock in. I'll do that up by hand to start with. There we go, make sure that's stayed. And you notice I've tipped the router on the side to do this. If I was trying to do it stood up, a, uh, there you go, there's a real risk that's kind of keep falling out. All right, it's just going to be awkward. So let's make it easy for ourselves. Just lie the machine down. Then we can go back and put in our uh, three quarters of the way along the shank. Tighten them on up. Okay. Now you haven't got to go crazy tight on these. All right. Often routers only come with spanners of specific lengths, so you don't, uh, you can't put too much lever in or leverage on it to tighten it up. I guess if I'm using a grunt scale, five grunts being white knuckle hanging on it, doing it up as tight as you can, one grunt being barely tight, I would do these up at about a three, I think, a two or a three. So we're going to insert our router motor back into our base now. All right, so if we can um, get there, we go. All right, you can just see it popping through. That's too far. I've got three kind of height settings on this. And I've also got the ability to fine tune. I've got a little threaded bit underneath here. And what I'm looking to do, let me remove that one. This is my workpiece. All right, gone fishing. I'm going to be machining this face down. This is a really good view. Now, if you're setting up, this is where you want to look down, this view here. So come the other side of your router table and look down this line. And you can really see what profile is going to be put onto that, that router cutter. I'll tend to set my height first. So I know that I want to introduce just the corner here. 
in this corner just here. So that needs to be just above the tabletop. I could use a little rule if you wanted to, just to, just to give me a little reference. Is that higher than the tabletop itself? You can probably just see that that corner's just drifted higher than the tabletop. Or just be happy that you can see it on your material. There you go. So you can see that corner ridge reduced there. If you didn't want that, well, what you could do is just drop it down a little bit. You can see that just drifting down. And all I'm going to do then is kind of start with a round over. This little quadrant here, this little round is the first thing you'll see. I want to add just a little bit more detail in that, so I'm going to go back up, as said, and just introduce that corner. Just there. I've got a little quirk, a little corner there. I'm happy with that. Cutter height is great. I'll need to set my fence now, so let's, let's have a look at that. So your fence on a router moves in and out. I'm going to eye it to start with. I'm going to bring your fence plates in as well. And I'm going to close this aperture as much as I can. This hole here, I'm going to close up as much as I can. Just to try and keep my piece of material from dropping inside this, this gap. Because if that's open like that, I'm feeding on through some small piece of material I'm working on. Remember that. It's easy for that to fall in. And remember, we've got to do some end grain work on a very narrow piece now. It's only, I don't know, 50 mil across there. And we've got to be up against the fence and then coming on through. So that's easily going to get lost inside here if we're too wide. So we'll close that down. Table insert as well. I'm quite snug around this area. All right, because there is a potential as well. You could drop into the, the hole in the middle of your router table if that's too big. Okay, let's bring those nice and close without touching. Often these are made, these fences are made from MDF or sometimes aluminium, but quite often it's laminated, co plastic coated MDF, um, just in case you do collide with the, uh, the cutter. All right. You see these fences? Right, MDF. And it's good. It gives you the opportunity to screw to them and fix to them if you need to. Some are like this. Now this is quite often, where is it? Come on. Quite often done on spindle molders more than router tables for the use of a, of a false fence. All right. You could put that over the cutter. All right. Where the only thing you've got is is just this hole in the middle. You can almost plunge your cutter through this. So you've just got the cutter profile coming through here, giving you more of a continuous fence to run through. Um, you tend not to get that risk so much of dropping into the hole in the fence here. Um, and this can be clamped if the clamps don't get in the way, or even screwed to your main fence. Um, just simply called a false fence. And you'll see a lot of joinery shops or a lot of workshops that they've got a few false fences to suit the, the various different cutters and, and jobs that they do. All right, so I've closed down the aperture. Hole in the table is good. This is close. It's not going to touch. I'm going to lock off. I'm, I'm, what I'm looking for now, I'm looking to see that bearing is flush with my fence. All right. If it was too far back, well, I think it's fairly obvious what's going to happen. My material's coming through, it hits the bearing, rides on round, and it comes back past the bearing, and then donk. That's exaggerated, but even a little bit's going to have that effect, and you'll end up with a little, well, it'd be like snipe on a plane, or I guess you'll end up with a little scallop cut out there, and it won't be that, that smooth um, line that you're looking for. So I'm going to do it by eye to start with, from above. I'm going to lock one end off, and that gives me the opportunity then just to pivot. All right. And I can just pivot that in as well. And there. And just flush that off. Let's lock it. I moved it as I was locking it, which is quite common. And there we are. That is going to glide past that cutter beautifully. Everything's locked down positively. Okay, let's have a look what we've got. There we are. 
you can see the shape and the profile that's going to be cut into that piece of material there. It's going to look really nice. Like I say, this is a particular favourite of mine. Great for edge moulding. Oh, I've got a teeny little piece of material here. Now, experienced as I am with this sort of stuff, even I don't like getting my hands too close as I'm feeding on through. There's only about that much wood between my, me and my uh, the cutter and my fingers. So we'll just slide on through, but we'll have a, some assistance from some pushing uh, devices. Um, you know, oh, thank you, Vern. All right, some little push blocks and little little guides and little jigs that we've made. And there's a couple that I'm going to use for this, and I'll introduce it to those as I go. But I think first off, I'm just going to do a test cut. So I've got a piece of board here. Um, there you go. I've got a piece of board. Um, similar sort of size to the piece I'm going to be working on. So just to, before I go straight into my workpiece, I just want to double check that the shape I'm going to cut, the profile, is, is going to be what I want. So that's where I'm at next. So I'm going to just pop my ears on because routing is quite noisy. Before I even plug it in, I'm just going to flick the cutter, rotate, okay, just to make sure that we're not catching on anything because as we close this down, like I said, there is a risk. But that's all locked in nicely. Check, check and double check fences. I'm going to wind the speed down to zero to start with and then bring the speed up to um, this particular cutter uh, is going to be running at about 16,000 RPM. So that will be about four or five on your scale. Now routers, kind of, I think annoyingly, uh, don't have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 RPM on their little dial scales. Um, they tend to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So you kind of got to think, well, if my router goes from 10,000 to 20,000 RPM, one is 10,000, six is 20,000, three will be 15,000. So you can kind of work it out that way, it's easy. Even if I can do it. So I'm gonna start slow and then wind my cutter up to, to speed. Okay, so I'll plug it in. All right, turn it on. And then wind it up to speed. All right, I can see the scale here, More about five. Turn some extraction on. Okay. Now I'm on a wider piece of material here, so I'm happy to use my hand at this point. And we'll just slide on through. Look at that shape coming. You can see that little corner quirk that I introduced at the bottom. And we'll slide on through, nice and steady. And we'll stop. Let's have a look what we've got. Zip, come to a stop, very good. Flick that around, let's have a look at that. You can see the shape that's been produced there. Now, if I slide that through, this is the corner that I was looking to introduce. This is the extra bit of detail. Then you've got the kind of double quadrant. That's the effect that you get from this particular cutter. It looks really sweet. One, two, then there's that corner quirk. And it's actually smooth as silk zero sanding, zero finishing after this particular job, um, which is what you want really from a router because sometimes these, these shapes and profiles are really, really difficult to sand, almost impossible. So you want it to come off the router smooth, ready to go. Okay, I'm really happy with that. I think that looks really nice. So I'm going to get stuck into the, uh, the gone fishing. All right, first thing I'm going to do to because it's so small and I don't want to put my hands too close to the material, I'm going to introduce one of these feather guards. They slide in the top track. You can get them to slide in the mitre fence as well if you need pressure towards, towards the fence. And I'm just going to bring that down halfway along the cutter. Very light pressure down onto my material. You can see the fingers are facing in the direction I'm going to feed. There's a big arrow there as well, which kind of helps. And these will literally slide on through and stop any potential lift. All right. I'll show you that again. It's a little bit light on this side, so let me go down just a little bit this side. There we are. Right, I, I want to put some downward pressure, but I don't want so much resistance that I've it struggled to get through. But there we go, that feels... You can see it doing what it's meant to do. 
Okay, so we've got a piece of material. We've got end grain, side grain, end grain, side grain. And that's exactly the way we're going to put it through the machine. End side, end side. Because if we put a piece of end grain through first, we're cutting this way, you're going to get a little bit of blowout, a little bit of breakout on this corner. But that's okay, because when we come along the length, we'll remove that breakout if we go end side, end side. That's what I'm going to do. End first. However, I've got to worry. I'm worried about trying to feed that through such a narrow piece of material against the fence, and I'm worried about it moving like this. So I'm just going to introduce a little, little jig, okay? So this is just a simple jig that's made. And what we've got here is just something to extend the width of this piece of material. Literally just drops in like that and slides on through. You can see this particular jig's done a couple of different jobs for us, which it can do. You can see the shape that's cut in this first section is a, is a, is a, is a, is a raised panel mould, actually. Um, quite a large raised panel mould. Looks like a little bit of dovetails happened in this area. Um, but it really just does save you having to put your hands too close to the material. It keeps your material under control. We've got this piece that we've put on there as well, just to prevent, help prevent any material lift, albeit normally on slightly thicker material. And it's fine for that to, to sit on the material. So something like this, for instance, that would sit on top of that and prevent, help prevent any, any material lift. End side. So, end. Okay, so on we go. Extraction. Slow and steady, feeding on through, complete control. Nice. Okay. There we go. Okay. And then we'll go the side. Now, I've still got that very same problem that I'm going to get too close to the material with the cutter with my hands. That's what this one's all about. Okay, back to the end. I know we're fitting between two jigs here, but it does make for a much better job. You've got no risk of the material moving. You getting your hands too close to the, the cutter. Right. Let's have a look. All right. Well, there we are. We over there now. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. No problem. Let's go a little bit back down here, if you will. Thank you very much. Okay, how crisp and clean those corners are. A little bit of fluff on this outer edge here, but but literally a very light sand over. Yeah, I will be putting my murka to this. There's next to nothing to do. Right, look at the detail on these corners. Okay, right. And we finished today's video with a gone fishing sign. Um, this will uh, hang beautifully underneath Mr. Common Carp. Size wise. So it's a nice introduction to your router. A bit of edge molding. This is really fun to practice as well. And you, you don't have to stick yourself to lettering as well. You could do, like I say, ivy and flowers. I've got a pagoda at home, for instance, big four inch posts, and I've routed in ivy all the way on the post, hand routed. She loved it. She loved it. So thanks very much for watching. I've been Craig Steele. Uh, in a woodworking wisdom video uh, next week what have we got so next week we have tuesday we've got colwyn doing some uh wood turning of course turning tuesday um he's got his bowl an introduction to bowls next tuesday on wednesday we're back to ben to to do some more pyrography so so stay tuned for that because we'll see this project come to a completion we will we'll be putting in the real detail uh, the, the shading and texturing and that sort of stuff um 
stay tuned for Ben's. We've got a lot of craft stuff coming in. There'll be some great stuff on using creams and, and, and finishes. And I think next week there might be just a little introduction to finishes. We'll, we'll drop a bit of oil on this. Um, Thursday, while well, we introduce you to another um, woodworking wisdom tutor, Jason Breach, um, hand tool extraordinaire, a real guru for us as far as hand tool goes. And we'll introduce you to a brand new workshop um, a very traditional kind of dedicated hand tool workshop. So um, at three o'clock on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Um, thanks very much for watching. Bye now.